Well, I've been preaching a series here called Thriving in Thanksgiving, and um, I'm really, really happy. As you can tell, all of our worship songs have been kind of focused around thanks. And it's, it's really important that we do that, that we learn to take the time to um, understand the value of Thanksgiving, you know, because having a thankful heart actually is a weapon that God has given us. You see, the Bible says that our weapons are not carnal, Amen. They're not of this world. They're not fleshly. We actually have supernatural weapons that can defeat the enemy. And one of those supernatural weapons as a believer is thankfulness, is being thankful. And so when we're thankful, we are actually um, defeating the enemy and his schemes and his plans against us. When we can fuck it. It, it doesn't, like, it's so weird because we, we think that it really doesn't do a whole lot of damage or it doesn't do a whole lot of things. Look, being thankful puts a black eye on the devil, man. And, and, and it's just because he has no foothold in our lives when we're thankful. See, the only thing complaining does is just lets everyone else know you, everyone around you know that you can hear the devil more than you can hear God. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. All right, good word. Complaining just proves that you can hear the voice of the devil more than God. And I'm not saying that, you know, complaints don't come out of our mouths. Look, we all do it. We're all human beings, okay? But the goal in our hearts and our lives is to position ourselves to be thankful and to have an attitude of gratitude. Someone say attitude of gratitude. That's what we're going to talk about today. So last week we discussed three strategies to unlock the weapon of thanksgiving. Today we're going to be talking about the attitude of gratitude. Turn your Bibles real quick to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 through 18. I love to hear the sound of paper Bibles. There used to be an old song. I can hear the rush of angels' wings. Anybody remember that song? I see. I, I like to say, I can hear the rush of paper Bibles. The older I get, the more lame I become. First Thessalonians <laughs> chapter 5, 16 through 18, and it says this. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. When you read this verse, it's so interesting to me because each of these is its own verse. And that tells me that just places the value of each three of these things. It places a value. The Apostle Paul writes this and he says, this is valuable, so therefore it is its own verse. And he says, rejoice Always, verse 16. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. Right? So what's it mean to rejoice always? Well, rejoice always simply means to bring joy again. To re-joy. To bring joy again. What's the Bible say about joy? I believe that joy is, is, is serious business with God in heaven. I believe that it is. Right, again, that's another weapon. Again, you know, we think, what's joy? What's joy got to do? Got to do? It, it's like, what's joy? Like, listen, when we have joy in our lives, joy isn't an emotion. Why? Because joy is a person, and that person is Jesus. And when we center around joy, that person, Jesus, becomes alive in our hearts. Okay, becomes alive in our lives. So joy means to re-joy, to bring it again. Okay, to remember what he's done. Okay, I will not forget his benefits, his goodness. His steadfastness. It's been so interesting. I, I told Kristen the other day that I've been going back in time on our YouTube page and been watching some really, really old videos. I moved here in 2015, and back then it was like the first thing we did. It started going live online. And uh, I, so I've got, we've got just a, a category, just a, just a whole bunch of stuff out there. And do you realize, Legacy, that we have done so much stuff we have done so many things in our community, in our church. We've had so many people, some of the, and, and, and this isn't just to be braggadocious or anything like that, but we've had some of the top name uh, speakers in the revival realm and the revival stream here at Legacy. Okay, that's, that's awesome. That's God's faithfulness. That's God's faithfulness. And I'm just so happy about that. I'm not saying that that's all in all, but man, why would God choose such a, such a our, our church right in the middle of, you know, little La Crosse County, 
right? And, and, and he should go somewhere else. No, God chose us. You see, the reason why God is choosing us is because we're just simply saying yes. Your yes is an invitation for God's more. And so when we position our hearts just to say yes, God says, okay, great. And so what I've been doing is, is basically practicing what I've been preaching to you, which is rejoying again, rejoicing again of all the things that he's done. Here's a, here's a good little tidbit here. If you are feeling depressed or down, rejoice. <laughs> rejoice. If you feel like the world's just going to hell in a handbasket, guess what, guys? Rejoice. Okay? If you feel like your candidate didn't win, guess what? Rejoice. It's okay. Life's going to go on, and we have something to be joyful about, and that is the joy of my salvation. Amen? So rejoice. Pray without ceasing simply means to, to remain dependent upon God in all things. Just to remain dependent on him. It's so, it's so easy for, for believers and for people especially, but for believers especially, to get out of the dependency of God. Because we're so American, right? Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You'll be okay. Get out there. Do the grind. Which I'm all in favor of that, okay? I'm all in favor of us making efforts to go and do those things. But we cannot do it without God. We cannot do it without him. And if you try to do it without him, you will always fail in some way, shape, or form. Even the most successful people out there still come back home and they're depressed and they're sad. Because they feel like they haven't accomplished enough. See, what happens is when we pray without ceasing, it establishes a boundary that says, God, I am with you and I can do nothing without you. Amen. And give thanks in all circumstances simply means give thanks not for the circumstance but through the circumstance. It's, it's, it's not a great idea to say, God, thank you so much for giving me cancer because I know that you're teaching me a lesson. That is wrong theology, that's wrong thinking. No, but we can thank God through the circumstance. Yeah. We can thank him through it yeah. because that is the weapon of choice for us as believers is to thank him, to find something to be thankful for. Even if you have to go back in time like I have been, right, on YouTube <laughs> and looking at all those things, it, it, it sounds silly. And it's because it's so fresh in my heart and in our, in our lives that our new grandbaby, Adeline, who's going to be here in two weeks, yay. Yay. Just want you to know you won't see me for a few, okay? <laughs> but it's so awesome because I look at, I look at Adeline and I see Caleb and I see my kids, I see Samuel and I go, God, you have been faithful through the generations. Been faithful through the generations. So be thankful for something, amen? So, I want to talk to you today about this attitude of gratitude and staying in this attitude of being thankful. There's a story in the Bible of the 10 lepers. Everybody with me? You guys know this story? Maybe you don't know. So I'm going to just kind of get, brief you here in the context of what this story in the book of Matthew, basically in the Gospels of what the 10 lepers are. And, uh, and to be honest with you, it's probably one of the most fascinating stories that I've ever read in the Bible because it, it says so much in so little. Okay. So here's the context of where we're going to launch off today and kind of camp for a little bit. Um, back in those days, in, in, well, now too, okay, but they have cures for it now, I think. Yeah? Back in those days, there was no cure for leprosy, okay? And um, you actually, if you had the, the disease called leprosy, you were actually considered an outcast. See, someone back that had leprosy in those days was considered physically unclean and contagious as well as spiritually unclean. So they connected the two. They said, if you have this, you must be, you must be a sinner. Okay, if you have this disease, you, there, there's something wrong with your spiritual, you're considered spiritually unclean. That meant a leper was completely shunned from normal activities of community, life, and banned from inclusion in worship in the temple or synagogue. So a leper, if they had that, okay, not a leopard. God help all the leopards. If, 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 if there was a leopard, they were not allowed even to the city. They for sure weren't allowed to go to church. They for sure weren't allowed to participate in daily activities and routines and lives. Okay, the leper couldn't hold down a job, couldn't live in a home um, with non-lepers, including his or home family. So they could not even live with their own family if those family members had, uh, didn't have leprosy. 
They couldn't shop in the market. They couldn't own property. They couldn't touch or hold hands. They could do nothing. The leper's only option was begging for scraps. It was isolation and waiting to physically deteriorate and die. That was the leper's destiny in those times. So as we read here and we kind of go through this scripture, so turn there, it's in Luke chapter 17, verse 11 through 19. We're going to kind of just take this verse, this, this story, and we're going to break it apart. Okay, Luke chapter 17, verse 19. So as we read this story and as we kind of go through this today, I want you to keep in mind what I just told you what a leper was and how they were treated and how they were looked at and how they, they, um, they, they had, this, they had this, uh, this thing about them where they, just were, they were just totally rejected in life. Okay? So Luke chapter 17, verse 11 through 19 says, On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance. Let me just stop right there and say this. Jesus knew what he was doing. It wasn't by accident that he walked through Because back in those days, everybody knew where the leprosy colonies were. And people would normally avoid those people. They would avoid those colonies. I had a really good friend who actually started a a leprosy house in India. He called it the Joy House. And he hired a five-star chef to go and cook food for them. And he hired maids to go and clean them and wash them. Pretty amazing, isn't it? So here's Jesus, he's walking along, knowing full well exactly what he's doing, right? It wasn't like, oh, 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 no, I came up across some lepers. No, he knew exactly what he was doing. Jesus went with the intention and with the purpose to encounter disease in the face. He went with the intention and the purpose to encounter this disease in the face, He says, listen, I'm not going to let this distract me from the will of my father because Jesus only did what he saw the father do. And he only spoke what he heard, what he said, uh, what he heard the father speak. He only did what the father would do. So he said, the father in heaven has healed leprosy. So therefore I will go to the leprosy colonies, right? Jesus went there to encounter disease in the face but little did those lepers know that they were about to encounter the only one that had the cure for the disease. He was it. He was the only hope. That was all. Let me encourage you this morning that Jesus is not afraid of our sin. Jesus is not afraid of any sin. Jesus is not afraid to look someone dead in the face, no matter where they've been, no matter what's happened in their life, no matter what's going on currently right now, he is not afraid to say, listen, son or daughter, I am with you, I am for you, therefore come to me. He is chasing after you. He's walking into your village looking for you this morning. This idea that people have that I'm not good enough to come to church or I'm not good enough for Jesus. I have to come to him clean in order for him to accept me. That could be furthest from the truth. Jesus will receive you and accept you just like you are. Come on, somebody. All skin disease and everything. With all of our sin, with all of our mess ups, with everything going on in our life, Jesus says, you are good enough for me. He's going out of his way to meet you this morning. And I would just vow to say that there's somebody here today that says, I don't know who Jesus is because I feel like I'm not good enough for his love. Let me me debunk that lie, that myth, and say, "Not not only are you good enough, but he stepped into your village and he's looking for you. He's not afraid of you. Verse 13, so these lepers, they lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were what? 
They were cleansed. They were healed. Yeah. Right? What's interesting about that is that the lepers weren't healed when they cried out. See, because how many times that maybe we've asked God to do something for us and we didn't get the answer right away, so then we give up on God. We complain and we say, well, God doesn't hear my prayer. God, God's far away from me. God's this. No, those lepers came with full expectation because they've heard the news. They heard the news. That's the reason why that they cried out to him. They recognized him and says, that's the man who has our cure. Jesus, will you heal me? Will you heal me? And Jesus said to them, go. Go show yourself to the priests and see that you are not cleansed. Jesus didn't heal them right there on the spot, right? Let me encourage you today that faith without works is dead. It's so interesting that, that, that the Bible says in James that even the demons believe and shudder. <laughs> right? James puts it like this. He says, you show me you say you have faith? Well, I'll show you I have faith by what I do. Okay? Faith without works is dead. Now, I'm going somewhere with this. I wonder how many times we've been asked to do something so God can un unlock something for us. But yet we haven't done that thing because we want him just to instantly gratify us right in the moment. See, Jesus, I told you you wouldn't do that for me. Jesus said, look, I told you to do this, and then this would happen. It's called the big if. If you do this. If you do that. And so many people, we, 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 we want to treat God like he's a vending machine and go, prayer in, miracle out. Prayer in, miracle out. Listen, I'm not saying that he's not going to answer your prayers. I fully believe that with all of my heart that he is going to heal you. But sometimes if God wants to unlock something in your life, you'll put the prayer in and then the thing will come out and say, hey, go do this first. Go do this first. And when you do this, then you'll be healed. Again, you have to understand that the spirit realm is much different than our realm. We live by what we see right now in the natural. We live by what's in front of us. This right here is real to us because we can feel it. We can touch us. We can touch it. But what is faith? Faith is the substance Things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. That is what faith is. Faith is more substance than this right here. Faith is substance. Now, I'm not saying, again, that we always have to do something in order for God to heal us. But in this story, this is the lesson that Jesus is trying to give to those lepers and to us this morning. See, if those lepers, if they would have just sat there and complained about what God didn't do for them, they would not have been healed. Do, 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 do you hear that in that story? I read it when I read it like that. If they would have just sat there and says, I'm not going to go see no priest. Look at me. They're not going to accept me. I, they would have came up with every excuse and the reason not to do what Jesus just asked them to do. But because of their obedience, because of their faith with a work, Right? Jesus then healed them as they went. So let me ask you this morning, what is God speaking to you? What is your as they went moment in your life? Is it your finances? Maybe God is speaking to you to give. I can't, God, because you know I've got this. You know, okay. excuse, complaint, excuse, complaint, excuse, complaint. You, you do see, God, the inflation, right? Like you do know what's happening, Lord, right? And he sits there and goes, yeah, I, yeah, I know. I didn't ask you about that, though. What is it that God is speaking to you? What is your as you went moment in your life? Maybe it's inner healing. Maybe you've been dealing with something inside. Maybe you've been battling depression. Maybe you've been battling anxiety. Maybe you've been battling unforgiveness. Maybe you've been battling something inside that no one else knows about but you and God. Well, God is asking you this morning to, by faith, take the leap and take the walk of forgiveness. Why? Because when you do that, healing 
is your reward. Amen. Amen? Amen. Verse 15. So here's the lepers. They went. Boom, all 10 of them. They listened to Jesus. Listen, they obeyed him. Okay? They took off. I could just imagine. If it were me, well, I don't know right now, but maybe when I was younger, I would be running as fast as I could. Right? <sighs> just bolting it. Right? <sighs> and then as I went... It would be crazy to see those scales and all that leprosy just fall off your body, wouldn't it? I mean, think about that for a second. How crazy is it? What would that be? Right? Ha, ha, ha. You know, and then they show it to the priests and they go, uh, you guys were just out there. Now you're in here and you're healed. Who did this to you? Who did this to you? And they would say, Jesus, the son of God. But what's interesting about this in verse 15, it says, then one of them when he saw that he was healed, oh, Jesus, help us, Lord. When he saw that he was healed, turn back praising God with a loud voice. Listen, picture, no, I don't want you to picture me running, but picture yourself running. <laughs> right? You're running to the priest because you're, that's what he said. You go, you're going to be cleansed. You're running. You get healed. Nine of them make it to the priest. One goes, I'm coming back. I'm going back to the one who just healed me. And as he came back, this, this, your word says he came back. He went back praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his feet, verse 16, to Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now, he was a Samaritan. Why did he say that he was a Samaritan? Why was that so important in the story? Verse 17, then Jesus said, Jesus answered, were 10 not cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Another translation says, your faith has made you whole. So here's this guy, this leper who just got healed. He did exactly what he's what Jesus told him to do, this, this outcast, this leper. And the reason why that the word says that he was a Samaritan, because Samaritans and Jews didn't mix, okay? They were not allowed to even be in the same vicinity with each other. They were not allowed to, to touch. They were not allowed. It was kind of like your, your current, not current, but, but when, when racism was really bad here in America, right? Like you go in the back, you go do this, like you just weren't seeing. They had separate everything. That's how it was. You just didn't mix, Right? So here's Jesus, this guy who's not supposed to be around lepers because Jesus is a Jew, and if you're around lepers, then you get what they got. So therefore, you're unclean now. So here's Jesus. He's a leper healing, breaking the rules because now I'm ministering to Samaritan king. And this Samaritan leper is the only one that came back and thanked Jesus for his healing. So here's the deal. I don't blame the other lepers for doing what they did because they were doing what they were told. There's no reason to cast judgment on those other ones because they were just simply obeying what Jesus said to do. They were, being in, they were living in obedience. But listen, for that one Samaritan leper, thankfulness unlocked something supernaturally for this Samaritan person. Jesus said, rise, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. It's made you well. It's interesting to me that the attitude of gratitude, his thankfulness unlocked wholeness in his life. It unlocked wellness in his life. He's healed, but there's a difference between being healed and being whole. There's a difference between being healed and well. What Jesus did for him that day is he says, I've healed you. Now get ready to encounter my wholeness. And everything on the inside now became whole. Everything became solidified. That person now says, you are Jesus, the son of God. Because he had an encounter, not just of healing, but of wholeness. 
And this morning, God wants to make you whole. But how do we become whole? Well, we got to thank him. Because that's how wholeness in your life becomes unlocked. Is the attitude of gratitude. When our attitude towards God is thankful, not only does he heal us, but he makes us whole. When we're thankful, what happens is it breathes an atmosphere for miracles to happen in our lives, for things to start to take place, right? You want to see God move in your family? You want to see God move in your life? You want to see God move in, in, in those places at your work? Well, let me just encourage you. Yes, pray. Yes, do all those things. But be thankful. When you get up in the morning, don't go, Ugh, time to make the donuts. <laughs> right? No, get up and go, Jesus, I thank you for the opportunity to go to my job. Thank you for the opportunity to go make some money. Thank you, God, for the opportunity that you're going to give me today to minister to somebody. Thank you, God. Thank you for my salvation. Thank you for my, my spouse who's laying next to me. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the home that I live. Begin your day with thankfulness, right? And what's going to happen is that's going to breed an atmosphere in your life and in your home for God to begin to do miracles at a greater rate in your life. Gratitude creates confidence in Christ that he is the miracle worker. And myself personally, I want to live in a way where nothing gets bigger than my thankfulness of who God is and my awareness of his presence. Let me read that again. I want to live in a way where nothing gets bigger than my thankfulness of who God is and my awareness of his presence. I want to be aware of his presence. Our cry and our prayer so many times is, God, we want more. We want more of your presence, more of your glory, more of your spirit. And God's saying to us this morning, I'm there. Open your eyes so you can see me. Our prayer should be, God, help me to become more aware of where you're at. Help me become more aware of your presence and of your spirit. As I close here today, there's a story in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, for those of you who don't know, that Jesus went back to his hometown to do some miracles. Went back to Nazareth. He said, oh, if there's any place in the world that I can do a ton of miracles, it's going to be back in my hometown. Right. After he was done visiting his hometown, they're like, hey, weren't you that carpenter's son? Oh, yeah, I remember I had, a, I had to find your parents when you were lost in the synagogue. Remember that? When you were, like, little? <laughs> oh, that's just Jesus. That's Mary's son. So Jesus gets back to his disciples, and the disciples ask him with expectation. They're like, well, how did it go? How did it go? How did it go, Jesus? Like, did the whole town just get radically saved and like radically believed in you and radically healed? And then Jesus said in Matthew, he said it to them, only in his hometown amongst his relatives and his own household is a prophet without honor. And then the word says, so he can not perform any miracles there. Oh, how disheartening. The man who just cleansed 10 lepers. The one who everyone else around him was like, Jesus, heal me, Jesus. I want you, Jesus. But in his hometown, he could do no miracles but a few. <laughs> when I think of that, I go, God, help me, Lord. Help me, God, not to treat you without honor. Help me, God, not to get so used to you that 
I don't believe in the impossibilities that you can do. Help me, God, not to be so comfortable with you that I forget you. I want my heart to be so pure and tender before you. And I want my heart to be positioned in a place where I thank him. Through the circumstance, thank him for who he is. Thank him. And just be in a life of thankfulness. And to be honest with you, I can find myself becoming too familiar with Jesus and not thank him for what he's done in my life. I can find myself being obedient to Jesus, but never coming back like the Samaritan did to thank him. But God, don't you see I did all these things when you asked me to? The scary verse in the Bible, the scariest verse in the Bible is Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, where he says, all these things I've done, and he says, depart from me, I never knew you. It's the scariest verse that I'll ever read in the Bible. Why? Because that speaks of me and it speaks of you. Help me, Jesus, not to become comfortable to the point, to the point where I forget you. So when's the last time you've purposely, intentionally thanked him, not just for the things he's done, but thanked him just for him, just for him. How about you? Have you recently been like the nine that have gone and done what you're supposed to do, but have forgotten to come back to Jesus to thank him? Let's really ask ourselves that question. Let's stand here as we close. I'm gonna ask Pastor Samuel Lester, wherever you're at, to come up here in just a moment. He's gonna close for us, but I wanna encourage you with something. Uh, prayer team, come on forward right now. Stretch across here in just a moment. Pastor Samuel's gonna have an invitation for you to come and pray here this morning with somebody. But what I'd like to do here this morning as we just close is can we just intentionally, purposely right now just thank him? Can we just close our eyes? And can we just find something to be thankful for and with our voices, out loud, not whispering, but out loud. The Bible says when you pray, say, there's power in your words. Jesus is teaching his disciples to pray and he says when you pray, say, there's something about speaking out loud. Can we just take 30 seconds right now, and let's just thank him for something. Come on. Let's thank him for him. Jesus, we love you. God, thank you for salvation. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for loving me. Thank you, God, for, for loving me, Jesus, when I ran away from you. God, thank you, Lord Jesus, for all the times, God, that I, that I fell away, Lord Jesus, and I did my own thing, God. But you were right there to pick me up, God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, God, for this church. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for my family, for my kids, and for my grandkids. God, thank you, Lord Jesus, for salvation. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for not giving up on me, God. Thank you for healing me. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Amen.